Have already for all the problems you have a chance. All right. So we're moving into vectors and stuff. Good times. Must be here. Paper would be good. Right. Um, yeah. All right, let's get going. <laughs> Today is May twenty first. Week eight, week eight. All right, a couple more weeks after this. No class next Monday. Just a reminder, right? The the the, the one and only three day weekend of spring quarter is next weekend, so don't come to class. I mean, we don't have class on Monday though. So put your other classes on there, it won't happen. Um, so wrapping things in three dimensions before we talk about vectors. Wrapping things in three dimensions. So what to say here, really? Really kind of the reason we're talking about wrapping things in three dimensions is so that we have some sort of context for talking about vectors. We talk about vectors shortly. But let's start with kind of just some of the basics. So let's say we want to plot a point. Let's say we want to plot the point two comma four comma in three dimensions. Well, we can't just kind of throw a point anywhere without giving some visual perspective. So when we plot points in three dimensions, there's a couple different ways you can draw the coordinate axis system. I usually draw it like this. I draw my y and my z axis kind of like i would normally draw my x and my y axis on two dimensional paper and then i have my x axis coming out at me like that that's how i draw some people do something a little bit different which is also fine some people draw it more like this and they have the z axis going up and they have kind of x and y both doing this sort of feel 
that's also fine. I find this less easy to draw on personally. Um, so I would recommend this, but if you like this, that's also okay. So how are we gonna plot the point two comma four comma six? Well, this is where things are a little bit challenging. Um, I really feel like we have to make some little marks here, which I don't generally love, but I do here. So here are my X marks and my Y marks. And all these are representing just one unit over. So there are some marks into those directions. And this is a height of six here. This is two over here. This is four over here. I could maybe make a guess. Like it's maybe right about there, but just putting a point right there without kind of drawing anything else makes it hard for someone else to see what you really mean. So typically when we plot a point in three dimensions, we usually kind of, for lack of a better word, we draw the box. So we're gonna draw a box and the point that we're trying to plot is gonna be the corner of the box that is opposite the, the origin. Which I think is how one of the questions on one of the homework problems is described. It's like to draw the box and to draw the corner opposite the origin. That's what we mean by this, which is a lot of words to say we're going to find this point. So I'm going to draw the following things. And here's how I usually think about it. From this point here, where x is 2, I'm going to move 4 in the y direction like that. And that's about 4. But what I'm really going to do is I'm actually going to go further than that. I'm just going to also, from this point here, move 2 in the x direction. So I'm going to move parallel to the x-axis, or as close to parallel as I am capable of. So that point there, I've moved two in the x-direction and four in the y-direction. I could label it. I don't really need to label it, but that would be the point two comma four comma zero. I've found four that way. I've found two that way. And then I'm going to do the same thing kind of in ev with every pair of directions. I can move four in the y-direction and then six in the z direction, or six in the z direction, and then four in the y direction to find that point there. That's six, that's four. That point there is the point zero comma four comma six. I don't think we really need to label all these points. I just like labeling them so you can see what's happening. Same deal over here. I move two in the x direction and then six in the z direction, or six in the z direction and then two in the x direction. Again, always moving parallel to whatever axis I need to. It's usually not a problem in the Y and the Z direction, and the X direction is a little bit more having to be careful about actually moving parallel to that axis. And then from these three points, I move in the final direction that's left. From that point there, I'm going to go six up. From this point here, I'm going to move four to the right. From that point there, I'm going to move two in the x direction to get that point there being the opposite corner from the origin on this box. So we can actually like draw the box out. Here's the whole box. And that point there, which is the opposite corner to that point there, that's your point, two comma four comma six. Not that we do a whole lot of plotting points in three dimensions, but we do do a little bit of it. And this is kind of how we usually approach it is by plotting a point like that. We could also do it in this set up here. I could go two in the X direction, four in the Y direction, six in the Z direction. I feel like this one's going to turn out worse for me. So again, I'm trying to move parallel and this is where it might be good to use a ruler. So from here, I'm going to move parallel to my Y axis. Say, great, I'm going to go like that. Here, I'm going to move parallel to my x-axis, like that. So there's the point where I've gone two in the x-direction and four in the y-direction. And then I'm going to move six in the z-direction. I'm, I'm cheating. I'm trying to get ahead of myself there. I, I should do it the same sort of way. So from here, I'm going to move six in the z-direction, which I can probably go parallel to straight vertical. And from here, I'm going to move two in the x-direction. But again, I'm always moving parallel to the axis I'm moving with respect to. Same deal here. From here, I'm going to go six up. And then from there, I'm going to move. And this is where I think, this is why I don't like setting it up like this, because I have moving parallel to the y-axis here is easy for me. I'm just moving horizontally, whereas moving parallel to the y-axis here, I have to be a little more careful. So trying to make sure that moves parallel. Like that. 
And then from all three of these points, I go that way, I go that way. That's pretty good. So even though I like this less, I will fully admit, I feel like this looks a little better. So take your pick. Either way should technically be fine. Um, you do always want to set it up though, at least I think you always want to set it up with X coming out to the left, kind of Y going to the right and Z going up. Um, there is something called the right-hand rule, which we don't talk a whole lot about in math, but it comes up more in physics, where if you're doing something like this and you put your fingers along the positive X-axis and curl them towards the positive Y-axis, your thumb should point in the direction of the positive Z-axis. So we need X over here, Y over here, Z up there. If you flip X and Y, it's kind of wrong. Not that, not that it's really wrong, but like it's wrong for a lot of math things we do. So try to draw things in this orientation. So there's a point, we can plot a point. We can plot another point, but I mean, plotting points gets a little bit old. You should practice it. I do recommend doing it this way. Like it's, th I think this is better than just kind of drawing this system here and then being like, well, I'm gonna go over two, over four, up six. And that's about right. I really, really think we should draw the box. So when you're plotting a point, draw the box. Okay. So let's talk about some other things in three dimensions. We can plot, we'll plot some more points, don't worry, but we're gonna talk about a few other things as well. So um, let's talk about this. So in two dimensions, there are four quadrants. You might have seen before, they look like this, right? Here's your positive x-axis, your positive y-axis. Here's quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. And kind of the way I think about it is each time you draw a new axis, it divides it up and it divides what you've got up into twice as many things. So if you draw just the x-axis, you're taking all the planar space and dividing it into two equal sections. And then when you cut that in half again, you're dividing those two equal sections into four equal sections. Well, with three coordinate axes, we're going to divide up all of three-dimensional space into eight sections. So when we draw this here in three dimensions, there are eight octants, which we don't typically label as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But we do talk about the first octant. So just like in two dimensions, the first quadrant is where both x is positive and y is positive. In three dimensions, the first octant is where everything is positive. X is positive, Y is positive, and Z is positive. So just like the point I drew before, if we look back at the point I drew just for a second, this point, two, four, six, is clearly located in the first octant because all of its coordinates are positive. And oftentimes we will describe things in three-dimensional space as being in the first octant, or we just want the part of it that's in the first octant. Um, where's the second octant? Who knows? I couldn't tell you which one's the second one. I don't think there's ever been an actual labeling of which one is second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, etc. You know, I don't even want to say that. I was going to say, you might even say like the one where everything's negative is the eighth octant, but I don't think that'd be really right because in two dimensions, the one that, where everything's negative is the third quadrant, not the fourth quadrant. So I don't think there's a way of labeling them that anyone has ever agreed upon, which is fine. Um, so yeah, first octant is where everything is positive. For those of you in the room, and sorry for those of you on Zoom, but you won't be able to really see this. For those of you in the room, when I'm thinking about what's going on in the coordinate system, I often, from my perspective, look at the left corner in the room and think about it as the origin. And so then I, which I'll draw in a second, I think of the floor as the xy plane, the wall to my left as the xz plane, and the wall that I'm looking at as the yz plane, which we'll draw in a second here. Um, so,
Down here. And again, we're not drawing the whole plane because you can't, because it's an infinite thing. But here is a portion of the XZ plane. Sorry, uh, pardon me, XY plane. So there's our XY plane. It's everything sitting on the floor, on the ground. It's where Z is equal to zero. We haven't gone up, we haven't gone down. Our height is zero. And similarly, and this is where it's good to be able to draw things parallel. Back here, where you haven't gone forwards or backwards in the X direction, here's our YZ plane. Where X happens to equal zero. And over here to the left, Here is a portion of our XZ plane, where Y is equal to zero. And X is your portion. So there's a few planes. Um, when we, yeah, I'm trying to think about what I want to say about this, really. Um, yeah, no, that's really all I want to say there for that. Uh, when I think about something being in the XY plane, I really do just think about setting Z equal to zero. When I think about something being in the YZ plane, I think about setting X equal to zero. When I think about setting something in the XZ plane, I think about setting Y equal to zero. So for example, we might be asked to then draw some other planes. So we could be asked to draw the plane like X equal to four. So x equal to four. Let's actually think about this in two dimensions first. So, oh, and here's some notation which I've seen in the homework, which I think is worth addressing. So in R2, which literally just means the xy plane, and I don't remember if x equals four is actually the question you all are asked, but it doesn't matter. Right? So in R2, x equals four is your usual vertical line. Now, here's what I want you to think about. When I'm drawing x equal to 4 into R2, I'm thinking about going over to the point where x is 4 and y is 0. And then I kind of just think of extending that in the free direction. So x equals 4. What variable in two dimensions is missing from that equation? y is missing. If y is missing, that means y can be anything it wants to be, and it doesn't affect what the equation is doing, right? X equals four is still true, whether y is one or whether y is a thousand or whether y is negative 23. So that means that we can extend this in this direction and in this direction. Now I know that's not often how we think about graphing this line, but it is a valid way of thinking about graphing this line. X equals four is the line where X is always four and Y is any value you'd like it to be. All the values of Y end up on this line. Well, a similar idea is true in three dimensions. If I want to graph X equal to four, but now in R3, which is just the three-dimensional coordinate system as opposed to the two-dimensional coordinate system, So now we're going to do the same sort of thing. It's good to label these. We're going to go out to x equal to 4. It's right there. And then, well, in the previous one, when we had x equals 4, y was the free variable, meaning we can move in the y direction at will. But now, in this three-dimensional coordinate system, not only is y free, z is also free, meaning there are no bounds upon which z is limited. And we can move essentially as much as we want in the y direction and 
in the z direction. Now we obviously can't draw this forever because time would run out. But essentially what we have here is a plane that has freedom of movement in the z and y direction and not in the x direction. X is stuck being four the whole time. So usually when we draw a plane, we draw it as some sort of like rectangular shape. Here's my plane, x equal to four, which looks kind of terrible the way I've drawn it, but it is four, it's essentially pushed forward four units. So it's in front of the um, origin, it's blocking the origin, blocks is a better way of saying it. Um, this is where I would say, Desmos 3D is your friend. I would encourage you all to play around with it just to get a good idea of how things look. Um, for example, let me just change this x equals four. Come on. I know it's not like super duper helpful to see this, maybe. Oh, that's not the right one, James. Come on. So there's what x equals four looks like. Now, this is the, the standard orientation for Desmos 3D happens to be not what I would choose. They're doing X to the right and Y to the back left. So I would turn this like that. And now it looks more kind of like how I draw it, but you can kind of see like, oh yeah, I've just drawn X equal to four. I've taken that X equal to zero and pushed it forward towards you four units. So there's X equal to zero. It looks pretty much the same, but then I took it and I moved it four units forward. So it's pretty much the same, just shifted towards you. And then we can make it even get closer. So there's our plane. And it is parallel to the plane where x is equal to zero. Which again, not something we talked about a whole lot, but felt like mentioning. Let's draw a couple more planes here. Why don't you all try drawing the plane? Mm, sure. If I draw on the plane, z equal to So drawing planes can be kind of weird. Like I want to draw arrows, but I don't really want to draw arrows. So what I'm kind of just going to do is draw like a rectangle in the appropriate orientation. So I'm essentially taking the xy plane where z equals zero, which is all this down here, and shifting it up by five. So I go up to z equal to five. I move parallel to the y-axis. I move parallel to the x-axis. And then I do the same thing here, hopefully. This is, where I, this is where I would pull out a ruler if I had one, and I do happen to have one, so why not use a ruler? And then, yep, not sure, like that, like that. Right now. So there's my plane, z equal to five, sitting above the xy plane. Can you guys kind of see it? Okay. Is it helpful? Um, let's look at another one, and then we'll do one more thing. Well, we'll do lots more things, but okay. Um, let's also graph. Yeah, I, guess I, could, I, could, I can make my graphs a little smaller, I suppose. Let's graph y equal to 3. The y ones are always the hardest for me, I think. 
So I'm going to go over three in the y direction, and then I'm just drawing the plane. Let's use green. So I'm going as much as I want in the z direction and as much as I want in the x direction. There's my plane y equal to three. I move three to the right, and then this graph can this surface has freedom to move in the z and the x direction. And then if we were being asked to graph something like z equal to five and y equal to three. Well then we would graph both planes and then see where they intersect with each other. So if we graph that. You'll notice a lot of our graphing, not all of it, but a lot of our graphing does take place in the first octant because it's the easiest for us to deal with a lot of the time. Let's see, so we're going to graph y equals 3, we're also going to graph z equals 5, and we're going to be a little bit kind of, we're going to be smart about how we graph this. So I'm going to kind of go up to where these two graphs are going to intersect each other like this. Okay, so here's my y equals 3. Moving with freedom in the x direction. I wish I could make my x a little bit straighter. Oh well. Here's a portion of the plane y equal to three. And then up on top, here's a portion of z equal to five. <laughs> and now they would they would both continue on, right? This one would continue that way. This one would continue that way, as well as like every other direction kind of. But this line right here, that line, which extends, which keeps going that way and that way, that's the line where z equals five and y equals three. And there's kind of, unfortunately, at this moment, no better way to describe a line in three dimensions other than just kind of giving you a couple equations to describe this. So when you have two things like this, like z equals 5 and x equals 1, z equals 5 and y equals 3, or y equals 2 and x equals something, that's going to describe a line pointing in the direction of the variable that's missing. So, right, so this line, z equals 5 and y equals 3, runs parallel to the x-axis. Um, and this idea is kind of sustaining through this graphing, meaning this idea of if you're missing a variable, we extend the graph in that missing variable's direction is true, very generally. Um, what do I mean by this? Well, what if I was to ask us to graph, say, the circle x squared plus y squared equal to 9? Well, in two dimensions, no big deal. In R2, that's going to be your usual circle of radius 3. In R3, well, we're going to start with that. We have that circle of radius 3 in the xy plane. in the xy plane, which again is the floor. I'm going to draw my circle of radius 3, but it's not going to look, I mean, it's going to be flattened out, so it's drawing it on the ground. So it's going to look kind of like this. I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and not worry about the x so much and just make it look nice. Cool. There's my circle of radius 3. And then... There is no z in my equation, so I can extend, not I can't, I have to extend this graph in the z direction, meaning I could have the circle here, but I could also have the circle much higher up. So I get this circle as well. Wow, okay, okay, James. <laughs> not my best circle, sorry about that. But the idea is that we can keep going, right? This circle gets extended 
up and down forever and ever and ever. So we have a cylinder. So in R3, x squared plus y squared equal to nine is a, I should be extra specific here, is a circular cylinder. And you might say, James, aren't all circle, aren't all cylinders circular? And I'm going to say no. So this is what you would usually think of as a cylinder, right? Your usual cylindrical shape, a nice tube, whatever you want to call it. Um, this picture, I feel like is not really doing it justice. A better picture might look more like this, where I just drew the circle here and then just kind of did that. The only problem with this picture here is without any arrows, it's kind of misleading, right? Technically, we should say this is still going to keep going up forever and ever and down forever. Unless they give us some sort of limits for how big or small Z could be. Um, so cylinders, well, basically, Anything you wanted to graph in two dimensions and then extend in a third dimension missing variable is what we're going to call a cylinder, which is kind of weird. What do I mean by this? Well, for example, z equal to y squared plus one. If you're graphing this in two dimensions, what kind of shape am I going to get? To me, I'm thinking it's going to be a parabola, right? It's like y equals x squared plus one. Usual parabola shape, upward opening, shifted up one, looks kind of like this. But now in three dimensions, since x is missing, we get to what we get to. We're required to extend this shape, this curve in the x direction. So, this is my R2 version. In R3, we're going to have oh, that same shape. Actually, different color. So here's my parabola in the X, sorry, in the YZ plane. And then we're going to shift it in the X direction. So we're essentially going to push it down this way so like that goes there nope oh, come on james parallel that's about the same distance that's about right there right there about there maybe we'll put it over here and then we're gonna have the same sort of parabolic shape here which i think is much easier to think of as like a piece of paper folded into a para parabolic shape. You guys all see this? See how that, that's really like, there's your Z equals Y squared plus one. Hopefully you guys can see this on Zoom too, right? It's just like a folded parabolic piece of paper. That's the surface we just drew. And it is, and we would call this a parabolic cylinder. Why did the name cylinder get attached to shapes like this? I don't know. But that's basically whenever you take a two-dimensional curve and extend it in the other missing dimension, we usually call that a cylinder. There's a couple of things we don't, but most of the time that's it. The exception being if you took just like, if you were doing a plane, for example, like if I took the curve, which one do I want to do here? Yeah, let's graph y equal to negative x, which I'm not convinced is going to turn out good, but it's fine. Not everything has to be perfect. So we know what y equals x, sorry, y equals negative looks like, it negative x looks like in two dimensions. It's your usual straight line that goes down from left to right. In three dimensions, so it's this line here. In the xy plane, there's your y equals negative x. Right here's x equal to one and y equal to negative one. 
Here's x equal to negative one and y equal to one. So I'm thinking about this line in the xy plane. And now, since z is missing, I'm going to extend it in the z direction. I like to think of it as kind of um, pulling down a curtain. Like, like if you think of like the line being like the, the top of a curtain or a shade, a shade is better, not a curtain, a shade. And then you pull down the shade, you're taking this line and extending it in the third dimension to make it into a plane. So I'm going to, except now I'm, I'm pulling it up instead of pulling it down. So I'm going to extend this in the Z direction and get my plane. Eesh. My pictures are okay. So this I wouldn't uh, this is this I wouldn't call a linear cylinder, right? Unlike the previous ones that I called a parabolic cylinder and a circular cylinder. If your two-dimensional curve is a straight line and you're extending it in a third dimension, we call it a plane. Um, and then one, yeah, one more thing. So most of these things we've drawn so far have been surfaces, just the outside of the shape or, yeah. But you could also be asked to think about something like x squared plus z squared less than or equal to 16 and y between 0 and 1. So I know what x squared plus z squared equal to 16 looks like. That's just a circle. Well, I really I should say a circular cylinder. And I'm limited to y being between 0 and 1. So here's what I'm getting. Can I draw this diagram? I should give you know what? Let's 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 listen to my inside voice and give myself more room to draw this picture. I'm gonna graph x squared plus y x squared plus z squared. Sorry about that. Let's just do this again. One more time. Okay. We're gonna graph. Sorry about that. X squared plus z squared less than or equal to 16. And y is between zero and one. So here's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start by graphing the circle in the xz plane, x squared plus z squared equal to 16. So that's a circle of radius 4. I'm going up 4, down 4. And if you're doing this kind of thing where you make these little marks here, the marks on your z axis and y axis should have equal spacing. But the marks on your x-axis, the spacing should be smaller because you're taking something that looked like it was this long and then you tilted it. And now the length didn't change, but it looks like it's shorter. So on the x-axis, your marks have to be closer together. I usually don't actually draw them. What I really do is I say, well, I need this to look circular to my perspective. So I'm going to go about like that. Well, that looks fairly circular to me. And then I'd be like, okay, that's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, if you feel like you want to make those marks. And then I need to go as far as from y equals zero to y equals one. Oosh, didn't leave myself a whole lot of room to work with here. Oh, well, such is life. Yeah, hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna change my y-axis spacing to make this picture look better. Or I'm gonna change my y, let's go from y equals zero to let's say four. How about that to make it look a little bit nicer here, just because. I would like this to look nicer. Here's y equal to four. I'm gonna draw the circle again over here. And then we have essentially this cylinder. So we really have everything inside the cylinder because we didn't just want x plus z squared equal to 16. We wanted x plus z squared less than or equal to 16. So that's actually the entire solid inside the cylinder that we have drawn. Which probably isn't super duper important, but again, like it's good to kind of talk about what we mean when we talk about inequalities. Um, um, someone asked how you know which side of things are positive or negative. Whenever we're drawing this coordinate axis system, we're always drawing this is the positive x-axis, 
This is the positive y-axis, and this is the positive z-axis. And that's why these are the sides of those axes that I always label, because I'm always labeling the positive side, just like we typically do in the x-y-axis if we're labeling sides. So kind of a quick talk about three-dimensional shapes. Um, this section, if you look at section 8.1 in your textbook, there's not like a whole lot there. Like there's some points, there's some plane, maybe a cylinder or two. And then they really start talking about the distance from them because that's what they're really kind of trying to build up to. So let's talk about, let's, let's work our way up to the distance from here. So I would love to talk about this equation. x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal to 25. What kind of graph does this equation have? It's a sphere. Oh, there's something else I meant to mention. I'll talk about that soon. With a center at 0, 0, 0, and a radius equal to the square root of 25 times mm -hmm. 5. So if I was trying to graph this and I didn't just know it was sphere right off the bat, I might look at what's happening in each of the three coordinate planes. So in the x, y plane, let me ask everybody, in the x, y plane, we know that something's equal to zero. What's equal to zero? Z, right? You're on the floor, you have no height, z is zero. So in the x, y plane, z is zero, and look what we get. We get x squared plus y squared plus zero squared equals 25. So we get x squared plus y squared equals 25. A circle, radius five. How about in the x, z plane? Now, which one gets to be zero? You guys are like, he knows what it is, come on. Yeah, it's y. Right, whatever variable's missing, that's the one that gets to be zero. So I'm gonna have x squared plus z squared equals 25, still a circle of radius five. <laughs> just in a different plane. And not surprisingly, in the yz plane, where we let x equals zero, same result. We're gonna get y squared plus z squared equal to 25, still a circle of radius five. So these three things that we're talking about here are what's called the traces of the surface. So these are traces, which I don't think is something we get too into in this class, but worth mentioning. These are the traces of the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal to 25. A trace is just what's happening in any one of the three coordinate planes, the x, y plane, the x, z plane, or the y, z plane. But then if we draw these traces, it's a little bit easier to see that we really do have a sphere. So we have, and this is again, where I'm gonna try to not screw it up. Sorry, you guys are um, unfortunately stuck with my drawing ability here which is fun in a lot of years of practice and it's gotten moderately okay. So there's my circle in the YZ plane. I would always recommend drawing the thing in the YZ plane first because the YZ plane is the one that's like the one that's flat on the piece of paper, which is the easiest for me to draw. And then we'll go in the X direction here. So we'll do the XY plane. So here we come, I'm gonna do that, that, that and that, here's that circle. And then finally in the XZ plane, so that, 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 and that. That's not a bad imitation of a sphere. So it definitely is a sphere, radius five, center of the origin. So the only real difference between the equation of a sphere and the equation of a circle is you've got that extra added on dimension. So <laughs> x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equal to r squared is a circle 
centered at the point h comma k, radius is r. And then the analog version in three dimensions is x minus h squared. Sorry, not analog, the analogous version, not the analog version. We're not talking about clocks. The analogous version, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared plus z minus, I don't know what letter we use, l squared equal to r squared is the equation of a sphere centered at hkl with the radius of r. And there's a lot of these things that there's like this two two dimensional version and there's a three dimensional analogous version, which is pretty much the same thing. You just add on another dimension. Um, another an example of this that we'll see in the not too distant future is the idea of a linearization. We talked about linearization in 17a. We're going to see an analogous version to that for functions of two variables, and I think at the end of this quarter or the beginning of next quarter. And again, it's really just the same formula, just adding on like another piece to it. So let's look at a couple more examples. Let's say we want to find the center and radius of the following equation, x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus 8x minus 6y plus 2z plus 17 equal to 0. So this is the equation of a sphere. And the hallmark that you need to look for to make sure that you know it's a sphere is you have positive x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and they all have the same coefficient. So you could have you could have 3x squared plus 3y squared plus 3z squared. You could even have negative x squared minus y squared minus z squared. As long as they all have the same positive or negative coefficient, eventually you can manipulate it enough to make it look like the standard equation of the sphere we had on the previous page. This is not a standard equation. This is a, this is what's called the general form, which is not usually helpful. Like the general form is usually the terrible form. Like it's it's nice because it has this kind of generality to it, meaning it's written in the same way as lots of other equations, but it's not helpful. So what do we have to do here to make this look nice? We have to complete the sphere. So I'm going to rewrite this grouping the x things, y things, and z things together. So I'm going to write this as x squared plus 8x, and I'm going to leave myself a space to add something on. Same thing for the y squared minus 6y, and the z squared plus 2z. And I don't really need the 17 over here, so I'm going to add it on to the other side. And then if I'm going to add things on the left, I'm also going to add the same things on the right. You can add and subtract on the left, but it's, it's more advantageous to add both things to both sides. So, what are we going to add here? Well, to complete the square, we take the coefficient of x to the first or y to the first or whichever thing to the first. That coefficient is 8. 8 divided by 2 is 4. 4 squared is 16. That's what we're going to add on. And the reason we're adding that on is because once we've added that on, x squared plus 8x plus 16 factors as x plus 4 times x plus 4, aka as x plus 4 squared. And that's why we are doing this. Same deal here. We're going to take that negative 6, divide it by 2, and square it. And negative 3 squared is positive 9. Same deal here. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 1 squared is still 1. So we add a 1 to both sides. The other nice thing about seeing this is then when you do this, you can see that this part's going to be x plus four squared. This is going to be y minus three squared. And this is going to be z plus one squared. Now, sorry, I don't think I was very explicit there. What I'm really saying is whatever number is in here, this eight divided by two is the four that goes right there. This negative six divided by two is the negative three that goes right there. And this two divided by two is the positive one that goes right there. That is always the term that goes there when you're factoring this completing the square. On the right-hand side, we get negative 17 plus 16 is negative 1, plus 9 is 8, plus 1 is 9. Your right-hand side might not work out to be a nice, perfect square, but it should always end up being a positive number. 
So if you're doing something and getting and doing this, you're getting something squared plus something squared plus something squared equal to a negative number. Double check your work because it shouldn't be positive there. Um, and so then our center, I always like to think of our center as the values of x, y, and z that make the left-hand side of this equation equal to zero. That's going to be x equal to negative four, y equal to positive three, and z equal to negative one. And the radius is going to be the square root of nine, which is three. But if it was the square root of seven, I would just leave it at the square root of seven. I wouldn't find a decimal approximation. Um, what else to say here? There was something else I wanted to say. Oh, I know what it was. Not importantly, but worth mentioning, the center is not a point on the sphere, which I know graphically is probably not hard to see, right? The sphere is this like ball surface out here. It's like it's like if you blew up a beach ball, the sphere would be the beach ball, and the center would be like in the middle, which isn't part of the actual surface. Um, that's worth mentioning just because if you look at the center here, right, it is, it is not a solution to this equation. If you plug in negative four and positive three and negative one, on the left-hand side, you get zero, and zero isn't equal to nine. And just worth mentioning, the center is an important point of the sphere, but it's not a solution to the equation of the sphere. Totally fine. Um, yeah, let's do one more. <laughs> So, yeah, let's do that. Let's find the equation of the sphere with the amateur endpoints two, negative one, three, and four, comma, one, comma, seven. So here's the picture I'm kind of imagining. I don't really need to make this three-dimensional, but fine. No, that's terrible. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, anyway, it kind of all over my foot. Me. So these are my diameter endpoints. This diameter goes right to the center of the sphere. Now let's say that's the point four one seven. And that's the point two, negative one, three. So to find the center, I need to find the midpoint of those two endpoints. So the midpoint, midpoint's great. Midpoint is really nice because you're just finding the average of the two points. So the midpoint of these two points is just going to be two plus four divided by two for the x-coordinate, negative one plus one divided by two for the y-coordinate, and three plus seven divided by two for the z-coordinate, which ends up equaling six over two, zero over two, and 10 over two. So there's your midpoint. Um, more generally, the midpoint formula, formula I can spell, it's just gonna be the average of the x-coordinates the average of the y coordinates and the <clears throat> average of the z coordinates. But really, if you just think about, about it as an average, it's really hard to forget that formula. Okay, so then we've got this center here, 305. And then to find the radius, we're going to find, you can actually do this in one of two ways actually one of three ways, I guess, really, is you want to find either the distance between the center and that point, or the distance between the center and that point, or you could even find the distance between the two endpoints and then cut it in half, find the length of the diameter. But I feel like if you've already got the center and it's not some terrible thing with fractions in it, you might as well use that to find the radius. So find the radius, it's going to be the distance between Three zero five, and let's say four one seven, just to keep things nice and positive. So, how do you find the distance between these two points? Well, the distance formula in three dimensions is very, very similar to the distance formula in two dimensions. It's the square root of 
the distance between, between the x is squared plus the distance between the y is squared plus the distance between the z is squared. Just like the distance formula in two dimensions is the difference in the x squared plus the difference in the y squared, and you take the square root of that. We're just adding on the difference in the z squared. So in this particular example, our radius is going to equal the square root of 4 minus 3 squared plus 1 minus 0 squared plus 7 minus 5 squared, which ends up being the square root of 1 plus 1 plus 4, which is the square root of 6. So we're not quite done because this didn't say find the center of radius. It said find the equation of the sphere. So then we're going to write this in the usual way. We're going to say, great, our equation is x minus the center coordinate for x. So x minus 3 squared plus y minus 0 squared, which I would just write as y squared plus z minus 5 squared equal to the square root of 6 squared. If I was trying to make it look a little bit nicer, I would write it as x minus 3 squared plus y squared plus z minus 5 squared equal to 6. That's how I would write it. So I'm trying to make it look as nice as I could. So distance formula, just like the regular distance formula in two dimensions, you're just adding on the z2 minus z1 squared as the third part of it. But it's very, very much like the regular distance formula in two dimensions. Um, yeah. Let's continue on. What time is it? Um, I wanted to mention that Dell didn't cover Euler's method, right? Is that correct? But I think the other class is covering Euler's method. Um, I feel bad, really. So I posted a video of when I talked about Euler's method last year because since the majority of people in the class see you from the Dell's class, I feel like covering Euler's method in class is not the best use of our time. But if you have questions about Euler's method, there is a video I posted on Canvas. It's near the top of the modules that says like it's a, it's like I, in fact I can show you where it is in a minute. Actually, I probably can't because I'm always never I'm never logged in here. Um, but if you have questions about Euler's method, I'm happy to talk about it in office hours. I just don't think it's going to be the best use of class time. So. Moving along to vectors. Yeah. So let's graph some vectors. And we'll talk about vectors both in R2 and in R3, meaning two dimensions and three dimensions. So we're going to plot the vector A equal to there's so many notations for vectors. Let's talk about them for a second. So there is one notation for a vector. Usually, if you're writing it out by hand, we put a little arrow above the thing to indicate it's a vector. Your textbook doesn't do this most of the time because they use a bold face type. But I can't write in bold face. So I, like most people, draw an arrow above my vector. Usually, it's a little half arrow, actually. That's standard notation. Um, as far as how we write a vector, you can write it as this. I think my preferred notation is the other brackets, like that. Technically, you could even use parentheses, but we use parentheses to represent a point, so I don't recommend that at all. And then I would say there's also, you can write it as a column, like this. That is also a notation for a vector. There's one other notation that I won't say just yet because we'll talk about it in a minute, but these are three typical notations. I am probably going to most of the time use this one. I think it's the most distinguished from other things or distinguishable. Like you look at it, you're like, oh yeah, it's a vector. What else could it mean? Whereas that, you're like, well, okay. So how do you draw vectors? Well, if there isn't any reason to do something differently, we typically think about drawing our vector as starting from or emanating from the origin. And then this vector is going three in the horizontal direction and four in the vertical direction, or three in the x direction and four in the y direction, or over three and up four. Okay. 
There's the vector A. I've gone. Over three, and up to one. The end of the point, three comma four. But I'll point out, you don't have to draw the vector starting at the origin. It is typically just convenient. I could have just as easily said, I'm going to start this vector over here at the point five comma two as my initial point, and then go over three. And up four. And that is also the vector A. It's got the same length and it's got the same direction. And as far as the vectors are concerned, those are the only two things that matter. If two vectors have the same direction, they point the same way and they have the same length, also you know, called the same magnitude, those vectors are the same. doesn't matter that they started at two different points. So I want that to make that clear just because it is important. Um, speaking of magnitude or length, the magnitude, which is just a fancy word for the length, of the vector A, well, we can find how long that hypotenuse of that triangle is by using the Pythagorean theorem. So if you think about it here, the length of this, which we typically write as A with little absolute value signs, although really you should, so when you see this, you shouldn't say the absolute value of the vector A, you should say the length or the magnitude of the vector A, because that's what it means in this context, because it's not the absolute value of a number, it's the magnitude of a vector. Sometimes people write it with two vertical lines, which is just annoying when you're writing stuff out by hand, but you might see this in a textbook. Either way you write it, if it's the this of a vector, we mean the length of the vector, and it's going to be, well, I can see here that three squared plus four squared is equal to the length of that vector squared. So if I take the square root of both sides, the length of my vector, or the magnitude of my vector, is going to be the square root of 3 squared. So in this case, the magnitude of our vector is the square root of 9 plus 16, which is going to be the square root of 25, which is 5. Which is everyone's favorite, right? Nice 3, 4, 5 triangle. Um, more gen... Uh, yeah, so... I would say more generally, if our vector has components V1 and V2, then the magnitude of our vector or the length of our vector is always going to be the square root of V1 squared plus V2 squared. Right, just think about taking this picture here and replacing the three with a V1 and the four with a V2. And then we'd use the Pythagorean theorem and we get exactly the square root of that square plus that square. And that's generally how we find the magnitude of a vector is take all its components, square them, add them together, take the square root of that. Well, let's look at some more stuff though. Which time we got? We got 17. Yeah, got plenty of time. So find the vector that starts at point A being two comma one and ends at point B being six comma negative one. And we don't need to draw this, but it's good to draw it. So I'm gonna start at the point two comma one. I'm gonna end at the point six comma negative one. Oops, two, four. Now the direction we draw this is important. It's starting here, it's ending there. So the arrow points in the direction of the point that we end at. We're starting at A, we're ending at B. And I would say that the vector that starts at A and ends at B, which looks like that, 
Well, what's the X component? How much horizontal movement have I made? Well, I started at two, I ended at six, so I've gone from six to two. And how much vertical movement do I have? Well, I started at one, I ended at negative one, so I'm gonna do negative one minus one to find my vertical movement. In other words, what I'm doing is I'm taking the B components and subtracting the A components. To find the vector AB, we're gonna take the point B minus the point A. That's how I'm thinking about that. Six minus two for the X coordinate, negative one minus one for the Y coordinate. And we're gonna get the vector four comma negative two, which seems reasonable. If we look at this, we've gone over four and down two. If I want to find the vector in the reverse direction, I could actually do the subtraction in the opposite order, but we know that if you subtract things in the opposite order, you're just going to get the negative values of what you got before. So if I start from B and end to A, my horizontal component is going to be negative four, and my vertical component is going to be positive two. I've gone four left and up two instead of going four right and down two. And what's the magnitude of this vector? The magnitude of AB is, well, the magnitude of AB is equal to the square root of the component squared add together. So it's going to be the square root of four squared plus negative two squared, which is the square root of 16 plus four, which is the square root of 20 which you could leave as the square root of 20, or you could simplify a little bit, write it as 2 root 5. Maybe I'm afraid. Find a unit vector. What's a unit vector? Length 1 in the same direction as AB. So, AB has a length of the square root of 20. I want a vector that points in the same direction as AB has a length of 1. And to, to modify the length of a vector, you can multiply or divide it by whatever numerical value you want. So, if I want a vector of length 1 in the same direction as AB, that vector is going to be, I'm going to call it U, equal to the vector AB divided by the magnitude of the vector AB. This is almost, not almost, this is always what we do if you want to find a unit vector in the same direction as the original vector. You take the original vector and you divide it by its own length so that the new length is a length of one. So in this case, it's a little bit not nice looking, but it's going to be, I would write it as four comma negative two all divided by two root five. And I would probably break this out to two components and say I have four over two root five comma negative two over two root five. There is some simplifying I could do, but I don't really want to. Um, I'm not rationalizing this, although we certainly could. A more fun question is, given the vector B equal to, mm, sure, let's make it fun, 12 comma negative five, Find a vector in the same direction as V with a magnitude of 10. Okay. Let's draw it. Yeah, let's draw it. The V is going over 12. Okay, 12 and down 5. So that's about, let's say that's 12 and that's five. Here's my vector V. And let me ask all of you, the vector V that I've drawn, is its magnitude, give me a thumbs up for larger than 10, a thumbs down for smaller than 10. Is the magnitude of the vector, is the length of that vector I just drew, 
more than 10 or less than 10? Just looking at the picture. Yeah, it's a thumbs up for me too. It's definitely more than 10. I've gone over 12, I'm done. It's more than 10. I've also gone down five, making it even larger. But certainly one of the components being larger than 10 means the vector has to have a magnitude of larger than 10. So let's find out what we're looking for here. Well, first I'm gonna find the magnitude of my vector V. I picked some nice numbers so it will come out nicely. The magnitude of this vector is the square root of 12 squared plus negative five squared, which happens to be the square root of 144 plus 25, which is the square root of 169, which is 13. So that vector has a length of 13. I want a vector pointing in the same direction as a length of 10. So I'm looking for this vector here, which I'm going to call W. I want W to have a length of 10. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the vector V. I'm going to make it a unit vector first. So V divided by the magnitude of V is the vector 12 comma negative 5 divided by 13, which we could write as the vector 12 thirteenths comma negative 5 thirteenths. And that vector does have a magnitude of 1. You could check the magnitude of this vector, which is a little annoying, but oh well, is the square root of 12 thirteenths squared plus negative 5 thirteenths squared which is literally the square root of 144 over 169 plus 25. Oh yeah, that definitely adds up to one and the square root of one is the one. You never need to check this, but I just want to point out that when you divide a vector by its own, its own magnitude, you really, really, truly do get a new vector pointing in the same direction with a magnitude of one. So here's the vector that we just found in red. Hopefully you can kind of see that. There's your V divided by the magnitude of V, which has a length of one. Then we want to have a length of 10, so we multiply it by 10. So the vector we're looking for, W, is going to be 10 times the unitized vector or the normalized vector of length one that we just found. So it's going to be 10 times 12 over 13, comma, negative 5 over 13. Which I don't really see a reason to multiply the 10 through, but we could. You could write this as 120 over 13, comma, negative 50 over 13, if you felt like that was better. How much time? Seven minutes, all right. A few more vector things. So we can add and subtract vectors in what people would probably say are the typical ways. So let's look at some examples here. Let's say we have the vector A equal to 3 comma 1 and the vector B equal to 2 comma 5. And we're going to do some adding. So 1, A plus B. And let's do this the nice way first. So here's the great thing about vectors is vector addition and subtraction works kind of the way you would hope it would work, meaning you're just going to add the parts together that, that are in the same spot. So if I'm going to add 3 comma 1 and 2 comma 5, I'm going to get 3 plus 2 in the x component or the horizontal component and 1 plus 5 in the y component or the vertical component. That's going to be 5, comma 6. It's also graphically nice. I have it written here. So it's 1, 5, 6, 5, 6. So if I graph the vectors 3, comma 1, so over 3 and up 1, there's my A vector. And over 2 and up 5 with my b vector. Then the way I can graph a plus b is literally taking either one of them and putting its tail on the head of the other one. So we typically call this 
part we start at the tail and the arrowy part the head. So if I just take that vector here and move it over to there, or vice versa, take this vector here and move it up to there. Make that one long enough, sorry. Either way you slice it, you have either A plus B or B plus A. And the resulting diagonal of this parallelogram is your sum. There's your A plus B. Which I think makes sense if we think about it, right? You're doing A, which is over three and up one. And then from there, you're doing B, which is over two and up five. So we end up with a result of starting at zero, zero and ending at the point five comma six. Is in around over five and up six. Um, I think addition is pretty easy to see. Subtracting can be a little bit stranger. Um, if I wanted to find a minus b, graphically it's a little weirder. Um, calculation wise, it's not. It's three comma one minus two comma five. That's just going to be one comma negative four. If you need to do it graphically, and let's just do it up here since I've got room. So A is still the same as it was before. A is over three up one. And B is over two up five. I've never been good about knowing which way you're supposed to do this. The way I always like to do it is I'm gonna say, well, if I'm gonna do A minus B, I'm really gonna think of that as A plus negative B. So negative B is the vector that points in the opposite direction that B does with the same length or magnitude. So negative B, instead of going over two and up five, I should say right two and up five, it's gonna go left two and down five. So left two, down five. And then I want to add those together. I'm going to take that vector and put it right there. From there, I'm going to go left two and down five. Right there. And again, sometimes the pictures don't work out perfectly. So here's my resulting A minus B, which is going over one and down four, just like the result looks like it is. So calculating vector addition or subtraction is pretty straightforward. Graphing it can be a little stranger. Um, there is this kind of interesting thing that instead of doing all the drawing I just did of trying to do A plus negative B or negative B, plus A, you could say, well, from A and B drawn originally, if you start at the head of B and draw the vector that goes to the head of A, that will also give you A minus B. I have never, ever, ever been good at remembering that that's how it works. I've always just drawn it out. And I would say there's probably not a lot of need for you to be good at knowing that. So I wouldn't worry too much about remembering what that means. Um, okay. So one more thing, because it's almost out of time here. So if I want to say, if I want to calculate three times A minus five times B, the math is straightforward. It's going to be three times the A vector, which was three comma one minus five times the b vector, which is two comma five. So then distribute, we get nine comma three minus 10 comma 25, and then we subtract. Nine minus 10 is negative one, three minus 25 is negative 22. So adding vectors, subtracting vectors, multiplying vectors by constants 
pretty much the way you would hope it would be. Multiplying vectors by other vectors, that's a whole other story that we're going to get to next time, which involves the dot product. So we don't have a good way. There's not a nice way of just multiplying vectors together that results in something sensible, but we'll talk about the ways in which we do have next time. All right, I'll see you all on Thursday. For those of you that have questions about Euler's method, do go check out the video that I posted on Canvas. I think it's worthwhile. Um, or you can always come see me. I'm happy to talk about it. Let's see if I can find it here. Let's see if I'm logged in. Cool. All right. So for those of you that might be looking for the Euler's method thing I was talking about, if you look in the modules, it's right here in the useful links. There's an old video of James doing some examples of Euler's method right there, if you care to watch it. All right, that's all I got. For those of you that need it, here's the attendance form one more time. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, I should be stopping for this. See you on Thursday.